quarter. It's Tuesday, February 28th at 7 yeah. p.m. Uh, Mr. Bobbitt, would you please say our prayer and our leader pledge of allegiance? Okay. Our Father in heaven, we pause now to invite your presence here with us as we go about the business of the city. Um, guide our thoughts and our decisions tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is now our public comment period. Anybody wishing to address the College Place City Council, please step forward, state your name and address. Council, Councilman. Scott Eppin, 1736 Southeast Grassland Court. And let me say thank you to the mayor and the council. You have difficult, kind, and problems to deal with. I have a comment and a question this evening. I've received two bills for these notice, uh, which I've paid, but no indication of usage because of the weather. The next bill that I will receive, which will be shortly, will include whatever the usage has been over that period of time. Uh, I'm just wondering if the city has made provisions for those people that are on limited incomes, when they receive that bill, it's going to be a bit of a surprise to me. And uh, they can find a way to make payments. I probably won't be able to do it. The other question is, in times past, we've used uh, months of December, November, I think, average to indicate what the uh, sewer rates would be during the summer. And so I'm not sure how that's going to be cared for with the um, usage that's been delayed over the period of time. Because December was not measured independently. And so the November amount and December amount could not be averaged to find out what the usage rate would be for the usage during the summer. <coughs> if anybody has information on how that territory is. Do you know, Mr. Duffy? Well, I think Mr. Rizitello would be happy to uh, discuss with you uh, and answer your questions. I believe we have answers for all of them. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your service to us. Any other person wishing to address the College Place City Council, would you please step forward and state your name and address? And one last time, any person wishing to address the College Place City Council, please step forward and state your name and address. Seeing none, we have a consent agenda before us, uh, approving the agenda for this evening, uh, approving council minutes for February 14th. Uh, the uh, December check register and financials and excusing the absence of Councilmember Cleveland and appeal to be Councilmember Dickerson. Mm -hmm. Dickerson? Dickerson. Mm -hmm. Moved we approve the consent agenda. It's been second. moved by Ms. Nyhagen. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Consent agenda is approved. Mr. Gordon. Thank you. Let's see if I get this up. Oops. One moment. your patience.
I'm not seeing my presentation. This evening, one moment. Thank you. Okay, we have an interesting uh, presentation this morning I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, Let's hope it doesn't run until this morning. Yeah. Did I say this morning? Uh, yes. This evening. So this evening, <laughs> it will not be long. All of mine are short this evening. <laughs> evening. Um, with that said, uh, what we have is uh, something a little different this evening. We're, um, as you know, we've been wa working through our well situation, and uh, as a part of that, we've uh, come to the conclusion that we should also be looking at the possibility of being aware and posturing ourselves for acquiring water rights when and if they become available. So what I want to do this, this evening, evening is just to go through a process uh, and ask for some direction from council in terms of how you want us to approach this. Um, well, let me go ahead and get into it. The role of water rights here in, uh, in Washington in particular is uh, Significant, and those areas where water rights don't mean a whole lot, but where water is scarce and where you have to have a right in order to actually withdraw water, that governs a lot of how you're able to actually how you're able to grow as a community. So, uh, water rights not only um, tie into whether you can water your your uh, land and so forth. If you're a municipality, it means it, it's critical as as to whether you're actually approved to operate a water system in the city in the state of Washington. Excuse me. The, uh, our most recent uh, water system plan, which we amended last year, if you recall, uh, does show that we have adequate supply through 2033. In the grand scheme of things, that's not a long time, okay? And the actual review of those rights did not extend too much further past 2033. And it was based on a relatively low 1.1% growth rate. So that's a pretty low rate of growth. It's probably pretty accurate right now, but if we were to speed up that rate at all, we might find ourselves falling short a little sooner. The, uh, the other thing that's interesting here is when you're, when you're establishing your urban growth area, you want to be concurrent with all your resources. So in other words, you want to make sure that you have adequate water in particular and other services available as you start to grow out your UGA, your urban growth area. Um, and water is usually the bigger resource that people have to look at in terms of how far out you can extend your UGA. Um, to date, it's our understanding that further expansion of our UGA is going to require at some point um, either new water rights, okay, or we're going to have to start moving parts of our UGA around. Now, I want to be a little cautious here. Um, the water system plan has quite a bit of um, areas in its UGA that extend beyond our current UGA areas which anticipate future water rights, okay? So there was some positioning earlier on in our water system planning that anticipated future water rights which we don't have to date. So if you look at that plan, you're gonna see a water, a wider, broader area of UGA than what we practically have today. The bottom line is, if you're gonna expand and you're going to grow, you're gonna to have to have a water to support that growth. That's the bottom line. I just wanted to show you here briefly the UGA area that we have. It's this pink line right along here. And you'll see a few islands. The dotted lines is actually city limits, but you can see it encompasses this area, encompasses this area out here, and there's some other areas as well where we can, we can grow. This, to my best understanding, represents all of our water rights for the next 20 years. Okay, so it's, it's already expended, used. If we want to, for example, pull in another area down here, whoops, we would probably need to go to the county and pull something out in order to pull, put something back in. Now that's, that's a long process, it's complicated, it may not absolutely require that, but in effect, the urban growth boundaries are drawn to reflect your water system supplies. So that's, that's kind of the backdrop for the water right market in our area. As you know, um, water is becoming more and more a scarce resource, and we know there are more and more folks out there looking for water supplies. Um, and the reality is, is though the basalt is not absolutely close to new withdrawals, 
it is very, very, very difficult to get new withdrawals. And it takes years, and it's absolutely not for certain whether you're gonna get a new water right. So if the city were to go out today and decide that they wanted more water and to put an application in, it's a public process or it could be all kinds of uh, protests, it is absolutely not guaranteed it would happen. You might, it might take you 10 years to get it, it might take maybe a little less than that, but uh, it's not atypical for things that take five, seven, eight, ten 10 years to go through the process. Depends on where they're at in their uh, processing. They've been better lately, but uh, they, have, they have a backlog, backlog of applications. So there's a limited availability of water rights. It's kind of a given. I think most people understand that. Um, the three areas that they're dependent on is the type of use, the place, the location of a point of withdrawal, and the uh, place of use. Those are the three areas you try and match with your particular need. Okay. And the current market rate for water rights is about 3,000 per acre foot. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, some context, our current water rights that we have for our community, a little over 2,000 acre feet, okay? So that's, that's $3,000 per acre foot represents a chunk of change. And if we're gonna be out in the market, it's gonna be a substantial uh, investment if we're gonna get the amounts of water rights that it takes to be meaningful to a city our size. So that said, what we're asking tonight, well, let me, let me go into this a little bit. Uh, we've been trying to think through ways that if an opportunity were to come along, that we could jump for it safely. And this is one of the strategies that we put together. And that is, uh, in our rate, recent rate study, if you recall, we put aside, on the average, it goes up and down over the years a little bit, uh, but on the average, and it goes up, about $500,000 over the next eight years per year is put a set aside. So one of the things that we could do if a water right were to present itself at the right time, and the right type and so forth, we could look at using these funds and deferring our system improvements. These funds were effectively set aside to replace water lines, right? So if we had a one and a half million dollar water right purchase, we would have to defer those improvements for three years, okay? That's not good. But in the long, bigger picture of things, if we're trying to grow the community, it may make sense to go ahead and take those three years that will increase our operations and our maintenance of it for three years, but then at some level we'll have the water when we need it down the road. That's kind of the trade-off. And that's basically what I'm explaining there. So a dis distribution facility replacement would be deferred to allow ability to purchase the right. And based upon the kinds of rights that we would be interested in, we would probably be looking at one to five years of deferral, depending on the size of the right and the cost. Cash flow, uh, because it's not this, this, this 500,000 is not the same every year. Some years it's almost nothing, but then it tends to even out as we go down the road. Over eight years, it's about $500,000 per year. We would have to manage that through interterm or interfund loans and possibly some other short-term funding arrangements. So, all that to say that our water rights are critical to our city's future growth and that we live in a competitive water right market. And here's, here's the kicker. If we go and we aggressively look for water rights and we do so in a way that everybody else understands that we're out on the street looking for water rights, those prices and those, they are going to go up. Or they're just not going to be available. Somebody else is going to snatch them up before we get there. It's kind of like a real estate uh, procurement or acquisition, where to get out of the market and everybody sees you're, you're hungry for that piece of real estate, suddenly its value goes 50% eh, more, maybe 100% more, depending on how anxious you are to procure it. The same thing is true with water rights. We don't benefit from being able to go to executive session on a water right. It's not a real estate transaction, and it's not covered under executive um, sessions. So what we're asking is a bit of direction from council. And effectively, we're asking, are you, um, would you be comfortable with staff monitoring the water right world out there, and then surprising you? OK? In other words, no advance notice and bringing to you a proposal that we think is in the best interest of the city, it would be up to us to make the case in that council meeting 
It would be a tough one because, you know, even if we were to present it at the beginning of the meeting and ask for a decision at the end, that's not a lot of time for you to make a decision. That said, if we do not make the case in a council meeting, you always have the option of deferring it. Okay, so it's not like it's a, you gotta, it, it's not like you have to do it if we were to go this route. It's a matter of preserving that market opportunity if staff finds one and brings it to you. So I my mean, question is this, would you be comfortable, because typically what we're trying to do today is really bring you forward the information one session in advance at least, so you can chew on it. We've done that with a number of other issues already. I think that's the best way to go about it. In this case, we're proposing that we actually surprise you. And then come back. And, uh, and, and so you would have the option, if we make the case, and it's, it makes a lot of sense to make the decision, the very night we bring it to you, you would have no advance notice. We preserve the market advantage. If you are uncomfortable, we could say, I'm sorry, we're going to defer. And we would wait. We're just looking for direction as to whether that would be appropriate uh, way to proceed in this in this instance. Can you repeat? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, at all with what, with what you just said. What what is the timing? Um, so, if a piece of land becomes available, you will need to um, to, to your comment. It, you don't want it to be widely known that it's available. And so, is there a way for you to lock that property down before a council meeting? Probably not. Um, so this would be something that would have to be, to your point, would have to be moved on very quickly. That's correct. It, and so something would happen, a decision would have to be made, perhaps even at a special, well, you'd have to, you'd have, you'd have to make that public notice, of course, but um, mm -hmm. this would be, timing is essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the surprise component. That is the surprise component. It's also possible that we can structure the, um, the authorities that you give staff such that we don't necessarily have to disclose who we're going to be um, agreeing to work with. So, so for example, you could give us the authority to negotiate up to a certain amount. And we would take that, we would run with it, and we would execute the agreement based on that. But we would give you, we wouldn't give you the name and who, but we would give you the amounts and so forth. And, in the staff presentation, and depending upon whether or not you wanted to go with it? Well, just so I understand that, uh, the staff presentation would be that you already have the land locked down with an agreement? No, we, we, we do. Can we, can we make a clarification? We're not talking about property here at all. We're talking about rights. The, the rights to yeah. rights to property. Right. Mayor Cotter, so can I, may I jump in? Yes. The, to, to answer your question, I, I think there's a couple ways to do this. If there's urgency and you have a buyer, the late notice route is one option. If you granted the city administrator negotiation authority to a certain price uh, uh, per whatever, acre, for, foot. For acre foot, you could enter into a, a uh, the equivalent of a, of a purchase agreement subject to council approval mm, yeah. that could secure an exclusive right until it's presented to the council. That would be another way to do it. But you would have to give the administrator some latitude to negotiate the price per acre foot. If he's within your set parameters, I think you, we could have an agreement that, kind of like a real estate agreement says, we're executing the agreement there'll be a due diligence period part of the due diligence period will be can we transfer the water right can we obtain all of the water right and will council approve it that would be the other way to do it and sorry robert we didn't discuss that so i've kind of i think this is evolving a little bit but it's another way to go about it that i think um, allows the council to set some negotiation parameters, gives the administrator the ability to at least lock things in short term, subject to your subsequent approval. I think that would work, um, but ultimately the, the issue is for the seller to decide how competitive the bidding is and how quick the city would need to react. That would also be a factor that might affect a late agenda item yeah, yeah, yeah. without much notice. Yeah. Good, thank you. 
Ms. Elder. Um, well, I'm not opposed to this position, but I, I was thinking something along the lines of what John's talking about, where if we could give some um, guidance, and I would actually look to staff to propose that. So, like, how much water rights do we think we want? So, I assume we don't want to, like, double our water rights. But if, you know, so we could say, you, as the administrator, are authorized to set up an option or whatever the correct working thing is that would allow us to make that agreement for up to so much water for up to so much price, you know, um, I think that would allow us to move a lot quicker than trying to put something together and telling them, well, we have to pull together a council meeting and we'll present it blind there and yay or nay. I guess my thinking on that is, are you uh, speaking of a dollar in total or per foot? What I was thinking was we would say water rights up to so many acre feet and that you would have be able to negotiate up to such and such a price per acre foot. I guess the only concern I have is if I own those rights and I know and it's public record what the price is, believe me, my price will not go below that That's amount. True. That's true. So, well, potentially, we might be able to come up with something along the lines of um, appropriate market rate, where we don't set an actual dollar amount, but we have to show that it's, you know, a reasonable amount. They didn't just double it because, oh, it's the city. Yeah. yeah. But I think, I think we would need a, an official sort of write-up that says this is the authority we are granting to the administrator. Yeah. I think we're supportive of that. Yes. yes. No, that's helpful. That's that's what we, yeah, we would go down that road. We want to make sure you have enough information to feel comfortable, um, and that would be on our shoulders to do that. And if we don't, then obviously you have the option to just defer it to you. So. But I would like to be on the record as saying um, I do think that if we only have enough water rates for about 20 years at a 1.1% growth rate, that we need to be looking for water rates. Which is why we're here today. Mm -hmm. So do you just want to motion to this? No, it's just a presentation. It's just a presentation. Yeah, just, just, just a presentation. Yeah, we're just looking for direction. I think we have what we need as long as yeah. there's no other council member that sees otherwise we'll go ahead and proceed yeah. down that road thank you so Appreciate we'll have we'll have that for the uh, council yeah. second tuesday of march yeah. i'd like to say that I, I fully trust our staff we have a wonderful staff and i thank you for that presentation very much thank you thank you mr gordon and moving along complete streets thank you mayor Okay, this, will, this is an agenda item we're going to take up this evening, um, as opposed to this morning. That was a uh, that was a jab at my gap earlier. So, what we did earlier is we brought you uh, a complete streets ordinance, and we did that at the workshop, if you recall. We told you we'd be coming back with that complete streets ordinance. Um, we have some changes. And uh, there's a reason for those changes. I'm going to introduce those and still bring you forward an ordinance for your consideration tonight. Uh, we, we initially addressed or introduced the concept of complete streets. In other words, streets designed to really cater to all users in the uh, street corridor, including pedestrians, um, transit users, bicyclists, and vehicles. Um, and we, we started that off with a quick introduction on the January 10th. And then we reinforced that at our workshop on the 30th, if you recall, and we showed you some proposed language. Um, and then uh, we have subsequently modified that language. And I want to go through what we've done and why. Okay? The, uh, our administrator had some conversations with uh, some TIB folks, and it turns out that some of the language we were using before, although it's okay, is not strong enough 
to qualify for the full mm -hmm. funding. There really are about two tiers of funding in, in the uh, complete streets funding brackets. One is 250000 and one is 500000 And one of the things, not completely, but one of the things that places you in the higher bracket for funding is if you have a stronger policy, a stronger code statement regarding your commitment to complete streets. The, uh, the statement that we had earlier was framed on the city that didn't receive the full amount. In fact, they received even less than the 250,000. I think it was a, just, a, it was 125, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at quadrupling that amount. If we can increase our policy statement, plus also put our foot forward on good projects and so forth. So we think it's probably worth, worth the, uh, the effort. So what we did is I had earlier asked um, TIB, Transportation Improvement uh, Board, for an example of what they would consider a model code. And then you, you got a copy of that at the workshop. What I did is I effectively took that code and put our name in it, plus added in some of our earlier language from the previous ordinance that we gave you that we told you we were going to present tonight. That should be in your packet. You should be able to see the new, I think it's, a, I think it's the second exhibit, should show you what we're presenting tonight. The underlined lines are the ones that we've added in from the previous version. There's no underlines. You don't have that? No. Oops. Well, we will get that. Get it. Yeah, why don't you get it? We'll well, why don't, why don't, while you go do that, we'll move on to a, uh, the next subject and come back. Okay. So let's, let's move on to uh, Agenda Bill 17048, uh, the salary ordinance. Okay. This ordinance that we're bringing to you tonight is the third version of the salary ordinance in this year so far. Um, so far. Only <laughs> third. Yeah. Um, as you may have heard, we ended up hiring internally for our human resources position that was vacated by Amy String. Um, Sean Doring is our new HR specialist. Um, eventually, we hope that she will be a manager, but for the time being, she would um, qualify as to be an HR specialist, So, um, which is what Amy previously was until 2016. And in 2016, um, her position of HR specialist was removed from the salary ordinance and HR manager was put on. Um, and with her leaving the city now we need to put HR specialist back on the salary ordinance so that we can pay Sean for the work she's done in February. <laughs> um, so that that's the first change that is encompassed in this version. Um, the second is that the planning the senior planner position has been removed and planning director has been put in its place on the salary ordinance. Um, this is basically um, our planner, John Rucker, has been kind of filling the shoes of a director position and, um, since Kathy Bowman's departure a few years ago. And it's time to make things right and compensate him accordingly to the, the work that he's been doing. So um, we have put the planning director position on here so that we can do so. Um, so that's that's why you're looking at it against me. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Gold? Seeing none, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve amended 2017 salary ordinance number 17-006. It's been moved by Ms. Selby, seconded by Ms. Sherman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, 
All right. in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. You want to keep moving? Keep, let's move right along. Right. We don't want to be here until this morning. <laughs> Yesterday. So, um, uh, <laughs> Mike uh, stumbled upon a, a grant opportunity, um, and we think it would be a good fit um, for part of our comprehensive plan update process, the public outreach part, part of it. Um, what it is is a team of five people will come in um, and they will focus on resiliency. And so what resiliency is is the capacity to recover uh, quickly from difficulties, basically. And so um, the American Planning Association has a um, laundry list of uh, resilient um, resilient um, statements that can be incorporated into comprehensive plans. And so what I did is I took a look at what is the truth in this map. Um, I could, uh, we, the focus area would be um, a resilient economy, interwoven equity, and healthy community. And so what the, if we're selected for this granting opportunity, um, the, a five-person team would come in uh, to call this place, and their background is it's going to be in either architecture or planning, and, um, and they're going to work with our community. Um, they're going to tour the community. They're going to meet the stakeholders on the first day, and then in the evening they're going to have a public uh, workshop. And then on day two, um, they'll work with staff and other key stakeholders. Um, for the next couple of days, and they'll develop a, a final, um, basically findings um, and recommendations, and then they'll hold another public uh, workshop or public meeting and uh, present those um, results. And so we can we can choose to incorporate this in our indoor conference of plan if we like the results of it. Um, I think it's a unique opportunity to uh, work on. Um, you know, resiliency issues um, so that we can have more, a more sustainable conference of plan. It's kind of one of the new, it's not one of the goals of, of uh, GMA, but uh, communities are working towards it. There have, there have been a couple in the state of Washington that, uh, that have gone through this process. And so. Any questions? Questions? This is more of a comment, but I think this is a really exciting opportunity, and it has not escaped my notice that ever since Mike has come, we have found all kinds of exciting opportunities. So I really appreciate you being on the lookout for these kinds of opportunities for us. Is there a motion? Oh, I think we have a Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Could you repeat? I'm sorry. What I said? I was just congratulating him. Oh, no, I'm fine. No. Oh. Oh, excuse me, they're okay. You can do the failure. Do you want me to take it back? <laughs> what we have here is a failure <laughs> to communicate. <laughs> Is there, a, is there a motion? I thought there had been a motion. That's where I went off the tracks. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're a bad influence, John. <laughs> I, I, I will go ahead and make a motion that we authorize staff to apply for the DART Pro Bono and Technical Assistance Grant to help College Place develop a strategic vision and promote community resiliency that can be included in the conference. And I second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I apologize. Seeing nothing, all in favor, I'm saying favor right tonight, folks. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same side. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Economic Development Tourism Events Commission. 
confirmation of appointments. Mr. Rizzatello. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, with this agenda bill, it's just a confir uh, confirmation from council of the mayoral appointments uh, to the positions that comprise the Economic Development Tourism and Events Commission. Uh, the positions were advertised for well over a month, and uh, the applicants who applied are below uh, Daryl of uh, United Country Real Estate, Jay Snell, who uh, is the manager of the Home Depot, uh, Scott Peters, uh, who works in business development at Columbia REA, Bill Clemens, who has a comparable position at Pacific Power, and Jeff Lambert of Andy's Market. And this is uh, really important so we could start brainstorming on the various uh, events and strategies uh, to get our economy kicking more here. Questions for Mr. Rizzatello? Is there a motion? Mr. Peterson. I would move to confirm appointments to the Economic Development, Tourism, and Events Commission. Second. It's been seconded by Ms. Nyhagen. Any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Rusatello, Lodging Tax Advisor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the so, similar uh, function except for the Lodge and Tax Advisory Committee. So this is the group who will recommend the allocations for the Lodge and Tax Dollars. Uh, basically with this, uh, the chair uh, needs to be a council member with two folks representing organizations who pay the tax and two folks who represent organizations that hypothetically could benefit from the tax. Uh, so below their information for consideration, uh, Council Member Larry Dickerson is Chair Scott Owens, uh, whose membership services for the Walla Walla Valley Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Ryan Williams, a visit Walla Walla. Uh, Kristen Taylor, who represents the Walla Walla University guest rooms. And then Emily uh, Poole, who has a vacation rental uh, in the city. Questions for Ms. Lisatello. I move we confirm the appointments to the Lodge and Tax Advisory Committee. It's been moved by Ms. Nyhagen. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Mr. Bobbitt. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Agenda Bill 1752, the wastewater rate study. Ms. Kilgore. Hi, I'm back. Um, this is an agenda bill to bring forward to you the proposal that was submitted from FCS Group for conducting our wastewater rate study. Uh, we went out for RFP and we actually only received two, two submissions. One was a more national kind of firm. It was called Raft Telus Financial Consultants. And they did a lot of work on the East Coast and some work on the West Coast. And um, we have worked with SDS Group in the past. And they do basically all of their work in the Northwest. So we feel like they're a better fit for us. Um, we already know their team, we know their calculation model and method. There wouldn't be any additional education as far as for me using the tools they give me to work forward. Um, and so we are, staff is recommending that we accept their proposal. Uh, we don't actually have a, a contract with them yet, it's just that we're accepting their proposal and um, asking for an additional 10% administrative contingency, um, which brings the total to $29,332, which is still just a little bit underneath our budget amount of $30,000. Questions from Ms. Gilbert? Ms. Sherman? Um, I'll make a motion to uh, that we authorize the administration to execute a contract with FCS Group for its water rate study services in the amount of $26,655. Second. 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 Second.
million dollars with a 10 percent administrative contingency of some six hundred and sixty seven dollars for a total of twenty eight thousand three hundred and eighty. It's been moved in by, by Ms. Sherman, second by Ms. Selby. Any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Ms. Kilgore, connection please. Last one for me tonight. This is bringing back to you the conversation regarding connection fees for water and wastewater utilities. Um, just a brief history of what we've done so far. Um, as part of our water rate study last year, we had SCS group take an in, in-depth look at our connection fees and what we are able to charge legally for our connection fee based on a, a variety of different cri criteria, which um, are in the slides in the back of your agenda item. And they came back to us and said, College Place can charge up to $5,681. You're currently charging $2,500. Um, let's have a discussion. So on two occasions now, this discussion has been brought to the council. Um, and from the previous discussion we had, I felt like there was direction to bring back to you uh, an increase to decide upon for connection fees um, from residential going from $2,500 to $3,500. And then the connection fees for all of the subsequent sizes that are larger to be raised. Um, I, base, I raise them by the same percentage that we raised the residential. So um, I gave you a comparison of, where is it? Is it not in here? This one, okay, it is. I gave you a comparison of what our connection fees have been since 2006 to what this proposed resolution would raise them to. And then also, I give you our neighbors, Walla Walla's connection fees for comparison, just so that you can see. Um, even at 3,500, we're below their single family residence connection fee, and we are substantially below all of their other connection fees. So, yes, I am doing this to you for action tonight, if you so desire. Questions for Ms. Kilgore? Why would we, um, why would we want to be that much lower on those larger As I recall, and this may not be accurate, but when we discussed this last time, we were, I think, we were a little concerned. We were talking really about the 2500 to the 3500 not, really not really the difference that Walla Walla charges $40,000 and we're charging $7,000 for the That wasn't part of the week. That's true. That's true. So, I, like I said, the single family residence increase was 40%, so that's just the, you know, what I applied to all of the others. Um, we haven't had an in-depth conversation about the commercial hookups and where those should be at. That's something we could do another time, um, or I could bring this back to you after there's been more discussion. What are your thoughts on that, Mike? As far as increase in the commercial. The commercial. Yeah. Is that, um, I mean, comparison-wise, uh, with Walla Walla, I guess that's the one consideration. Yeah. But does the higher rate, does it, does it concern you that it, that would um, uh, deter a business? 
Typically with the connection fees, that really won't deter business because uh, paying for utilities, especially connections, that's just part of it. Uh, the things that really affect business, at least from what I've seen in other locales that I've worked at, believe it or not, is like how high you have your business license and a scheme of things. It, it doesn't seem like much. It seems like symbolically, though, that's like the straw that breaks the camel's back if you if you have your business license too high. But connection fees, it seems to be part of the doing business. So is there a reason that we wouldn't want to increase ours to get a little closer to that uh, I, I, I mean, we, we could ask, honestly, in this, we were uh, look, we were mainly concentrating on the residential side of it, but yeah. it's a valid point, though. So, Ms. Hill? Perhaps instead of looking at how much we increased, we could look at and say, well, we're about, what, 5% or whatever less than Walla Walla, if we kept that much less than Walla Walla for all of them. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have a question for uh, Mr. Hartwig. What, what kind of business would require a uh, six inch connection? There won't be those Walmarts. Those are the ones that have the big ones. Uh, the only other thing would be to you. And the only other would be the big, uh, big buildings. Uh, even though we don't serve all of them uh, with college for fire flow, but those would be for fire flow. Mm -hmm. So, I, well, let me float this. Uh, should we take a look at this again, perhaps in the future? Um, uh, with the recommendation that we are, what would the percentage be? 10% below Walla Walla's amounts? Is that? Yeah, I mean, what, is, uh, what would the process be on, on you guys looking at rates and coming up with a proposal or are we supposed to provide input? Because, or we could also approve this so that we at least have the residential plan. I would, I mean, I think the staff recommendation would at least be to approve the residential side mm -hmm. if you also choose and then direct us to look deeper on the commercial side. I guess um, from my perspective, I, we had a, we had a connection fee study done on the residential, mm -hmm. but we didn't have them look at our commercial. So if we were considering that substantial of an increase to other connection fees. Um, I'm not sure how comfortable I would be with that off the cuff without having a little more analysis done by someone who you know knows how to calculate the legal requirement that we can use. What are we paying for a consultant on that? Um, the connection, I want to say it was I believe it was about five thousand dollars additional to have them do the connection study for the water. Is that a field study? No, it's small. Okay, that's the same. Right. Yeah. 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 Is that something that they could do for us? Are they available to do so? Um, I, I could certainly see. I'm sure they would be glad to help us with that. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, I'm sure we can all figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, I, I have dice and a dart for it. Yes, we're ready. <laughs> Mr. Hartwig, did you have a. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, Paul, Paul's point. Um, that he just made is that we really don't have that many of these commercial accounts that would be paying these um, connection fees for the, the large connections. Don't we want to get them? Yeah. Yeah. So we want to get, get them. them. Yeah. We want to get the business. Right, yeah. but I'd rather get them and help. But what Mike was just saying is that they're going to pay it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't want to deter them. But we're talking about maybe three or four mm -hmm. versus the. Uh, yeah, residential, which could be yeah. 30, 40, 50, yeah. Well, yeah, on a quantitative basis, naturally, uh, 
the option of getting a lot more residential will be that against the commercial. There'll be f fewer, but I, I mean, it's something to look at, though. Yeah, but if we're looking at the difference between 30,000 and 100,000, even on ones, yeah. that might be different. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion? Ms. Elby. Um, Mr. Chair, I would move that we adopt the proposed resolution 17.4-006, updating the administrative fees resolution for increased connection fees for water and wastewater as presented. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Do we need to add that one? I'd like to have a follow-up motion yeah. after we vote on this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Ms. Selby. May I make a comment before you motion? Sure. Um, I think that I could probably call Angie, who is our principal on this, and ask her if... Um, we can just do an addition to the previous study, since we've already done the water study, um, so that we don't have to go out for RFP and all of that again. <laughs> well, um, my motion is that we ask staff to come up with a proposal for us to review the commercial connection fees. It's been seconded by Ms. Sherman. Any further discussion? And I think that's a perfectly logical way to go about it, but I just yeah. want to leave you the leeway in case that doesn't work out to okay. give us other proposals. Thank you. Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Back to Mr. Gordon. I see you have once again returned. Can I try to hide? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think what happened here is we had actually had the complete streets on there a couple times on our agenda and we pulled it off in the most recent one. Waiting to you folks could peruse the materials yeah. in front of you. I have a question on so yes. this one that we got is the, the new and improved, right? Yes. Okay. okay. That's what I was referring to in the presentation yeah. that nobody had. Um, so so what we've done is what you actually had in your packets, I think was the old one, um, which is your exhibit three when I just handed out. So uh, I'll just continue. The uh, the one with the underlines, exhibit two, that is the new complete streets policy. It's strengthened, it has more language. This is based on Aberdeen, City of Aberdeen, which TIP says gets full points. Okay? Yep. So what again, what I did is I took City of Aberdeen, did a replace name with City of College Place, mm -hmm. and then I added in some of the language from our previous um, proposal that I think tempers some of it just a little bit. So we have a little bit more flexibility. So that's what you have in front of you. Um, and just to summarize the modifications, um, it fully adopts the City of Aberdeen Code, which again, TIB can, uh, basically says is their model code. In other words, they gave it the full $500,000 when it came up. Uh, it includes language from the original ordinance that references a comprehensive plan. So our language, in addition to Aberdeen's language, references a comprehensive plan, so it shows it ties in 
to our planning process. I don't think that's a bad thing. Provides greater detail with ex regard to exempted maintenance activities. Pretty similar. We just show a little bit more detail in there, so it's very clear that uh, basically if we're doing a chip seal, that, that doesn't constitute having to put down um, sharrows or something like that, unless they're already there. It adds an exemption for pavement opening. In other words, if we open a pavement, do a street crossing or something, we don't end up having to do complete streets as a result of that activity. Adds public safety and accessibility exemptions. Um, in other words, if there's a public safety issue or if it's just inaccessible, then we're not going to do complete streets components on that part of the road. Does that make sense? In other words, if it causes a safety issue, causes people to cross in a place where it might hurt somebody, we're not going to do complete streets right there. If, on the same, uh, by the same token, if we just can't get there from here because there's a railroad track and there's no way to get across safely, we're not going to do complete streets in that area either. So just a couple of exemptions that we can use if we need to, uh, to not necessarily put into place components that don't make a lot of sense. Okay, and also clarifies that external funding will be a part of our implementation approach. This is important because uh, we don't want them to come back to us and say, well, you said you passed the complete street ordinance, you have to fund all of it no matter what, no matter where you get your money from. We are basically presuming that we are going to be getting external funds as well to, in fact, put complete streets components into our streets. Okay. So that's what we've done to modify it. We strengthened some of the language. Um, the Aberdeen language includes this phrase here, all new construction, retrofit, or reconstruction projects. That was not in the earlier um, code that we were proposing. Okay, so this is basically everything that we're looking at. We're going to include complete streets components. The goals section was changed. You can look at that as well. I don't think it's terribly important, but it, it changed explicitly to reference our external agency partnerships in the area. Okay. And then it adds industry be best practice standards, okay, BMPs. In other words, we're going to do the sidewalks to ADA. We're going to do uh, corner intersections in a way that are considered best practice. We're going to uh, develop bike lanes in ways or share roads in ways that are considered best practice. Um, just make sure that we're not using substandard industry standards. And then uh, finally, uh, as performance standards and benchmarks. Okay, and I think the example they gave was if you had, I think Tiago was saying if you had like however many extra ADA ramps that you put in this year, that's a benchmark. You were able to increase and improve your system by this many ADA ramps. So that would be a benchmark. So we'll have to look at that as a part of this. Okay, so that kind of summarizes, I don't think I have anything more here. That's the differences. We've strengthened it, we've made it a little bit more thorough. Um, and as a result, we will have, um, if we were to go ahead and pass this, then we'll be looking at every single street project we do in the, in, through the lens of complete streets. What that will mean for our community will be a lot more um, flexible corridors to be used by a lot more different parties. Uh, I think ultimately, although this is probably not an engineer's purview, but I think aesthetically it would help um, our community. Um, there's costs associated with it, there's also money associated with it. So that's the, uh, our hope is to be able to find ourselves in a position where we'll be able to um, pull in quite a bit more funding for our projects and at the same time improve the community. Questions, Ms. Selby? I have a couple questions. Um, is there a time frame when we need to get this adopted for the application? Do we need to do it tonight? Or the sooner? The better, Mike, I'll let you speak to that. Well, there is a grant opportunity. The, it ends up closing in May, but they look retroactively as far as when you adopted these ordinances. So I think we would have a better chance uh, adopting it sooner. That's mm -hmm. And second question, um, which I'm not sure if we can just wordsmith it now or if we want to think about it, but. Um, I noticed the horses aren't in here, and I've also thought about, um, since then, I've thought about, well, what about skateboards, um, longboards, and I kind of don't want to add a laundry list 
is what, and you know, the engineers over in Kretschmar are constantly trying to invent new stuff. So um, it seems like that we ought to say something, some sort of catch-all that says and other commonly used um, methods of transportation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm not actually prepared to like give language a second, which is why my question was about can we wait till next time? But um, mm -hmm. but I just one of the things that um, I just remember teens for so many years complain about is you know um, they always whatever's cool to them their skateboards or their longboards or their hoverboards are always like illegal everywhere and you know they feel left out and so making it so that we can accommodate them as well I think would be helpful. Uh, I will add one comment about this complete street code because ran into a similar situation in Colfax about the wordsmith and to get it on the books so that way we got more points over there. Uh, the city council of Colfax ended up adopting and then went back a couple of council meetings down the road and changed some of the wording because just as long as you aren't overly changing the spirit of the ordinance, uh, Transportation Improvement Board does not care. It's, it, so as long as the spirit is not... So then we can change that by Yeah. Further questions for Mr. Bird? I was going to say, I apologize for missing the horses. My, da my daughter is an avid horse lover, so I, I, yeah. You don't even ride. I'm just trying to be. Yeah, <laughs> but I was thinking we probably need to include driverless cars too. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> oh please. <laughs> May I, I make a motion to approve complete streets ordinance and adopt amended code proposal? You should have the ordinance number. The ordinance number would be the same as what you have seen in your packet. It's just that this is the version that I saw. Yeah. Tell me those are about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's been moved. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been seconded by Ms. Sherman. All in any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Gordon, dispute review board. Okay. This is, uh, this is another uh, interesting action item for tonight. Um, this is related to the CARS project. Um, the timing was not great. We received uh, just before, I think it was a day or two before, some hint that we were going to, uh, that our contractor was concerned about the, uh, the utility coordination on the project and that there may be a claim or that there would be a claim coming. Um, we had heard grumblings all the way along through the project as a part of this, so um, it wasn't entirely a surprise. Um, however, long throughout the project we had advised the contractor to follow our uh, contractual procedures for lodging complaint of saying that perhaps the scope had increased, whatever it was. And um, to date our contention has been those processes weren't really fully followed, or if, if at all. In some cases they were and, and we were able to give them uh, change orders to address any changes that they were able to bring to our attention. So where we're at today um, is if you go through a claim process in our contract and you're not able to come to agreement, either party can go to what's called the dispute uh, resolution board, which is what I want to talk about here in just a moment. Um, and in fact, what occurred, what happened was Scout Lake came to us and said, look, we feel like we've been damaged. We feel like the scope of the project has increased. We feel like um, there was more utility coordination than we expected. So we would like to elevate this to a dispute review resolution board. And uh, staff at that level agreed, said, okay, I mean, that sounds reasonable. I mean, the alternative would be go directly to court. Um, and the idea is to possibly, uh, if, if at all, get somebody who is uh, 
not representing us, but just appointed and is a dispassionate observer and, and tries to come up with a reasoned solution, get some of those folks on board to take a look at it and come up with recommendations to the two parties. Um, so that's what, that's what this is about. Let me go ahead and run through the chronology. Um, we did get this claim on November 29th. Okay, that was just at the end of last year. Um, and uh, Keller Associates, upon receipt of the claim, the notice of claim, it wasn't really even essentially a claim, but the fact that they were going to lodge a claim with some supporting information, they, didn't, they denied it, and they said they just don't have the information tying what you're saying happened to the damages. You're just saying you didn't make as much, at this point, you're not making as much money as you thought you would. It cost you more. But the link between that and what actually occurred is not obvious. So uh, that claim was denied, and then on the 15th of December, they said, well, we would like to establish a dispute review board. And uh, in our contract, that's actually usually, if either party wants to pursue it up front, established in the first 60 days of the contract. And neither of us did, okay? We just figured we'd get through without a dispute review board. Here at the end of the contract, we still have that option. And so we're going through it in arrears, as it were, and setting this up. So here's how a DRB works, a uh, dispute resolution board. Um, SLC, or Scout Lake Construction, our contractor, they appoint a member, okay? Again, they're not a representative. They're not supposed to be representative of Scout Lake. They're supposed to be a dispassionate, dispassionate observer that doesn't have any uh, irons in the fire for anybody, just looking at the contract to see and read it, to see how it actually, what it says, and whether we follow procedures and so forth. The city also appoints a member, okay? And as a, we, we, and either party has to agree to uh, the other appointee. So we have to agree to Scott Lake's appointee. They have to agree to ours, okay? And then, of course, you have a tiebreaker. Those two seated members on the dis DRB then select a third dispassionate member who sits on the board, and then the three of them together um, review the facts and, the fi and make findings. In terms of cost, Scott Lake pays for their appointee, we pay for ours, and we split the cost of the third member. The agency, in this case, the city, we actually also pay for meeting costs and facility costs. So there's a little bit extra on our side. Here's how it works. Um, the DRB board is formed and operates according to Washington specifications in our contract. Um, they are not representatives. They act impartially. They're kind of like judges in that regard. Um, there is a tendency, in fact, um, in the language that we get, uh, the proposed agreements that we've gotten from the member that we would like to appoint, he's very clear. He says that we, he is not our representative. He is there to act impartially. And he pointed out to me in his conversation, he says, if you have a problem with that, let me know because this is the only way I'll operate. Uh, there's about, I would say, a handful of these folks who operate or work on these DRB boards across the state. We all know each other very, very well. And they represent frequently both the contractor and sometimes the agency. It doesn't, doesn't matter to them. They're, they're impartial, okay? They have to have experience and expertise in the area of the dispute, okay? And that's important. Um, when the board comes forward and comes to its conclusions and make recommendations, it's important to understand this is an attempt to negotiate an agreement, to come to agreement on something without having to go to court. Uh, I should add that in addition to the DRB process, we're also informally engaging Scout Lake to see if there's a way we can come up to a, some kind of an amicable <laughs> agreement that they can agree to, we can agree to, we can walk away and say, okay, it's good. Short of that, we go to the DRB, and their recommendations are not legally binding, legally binding, but they are admissible and subsequent litigation, so there's some value there. So in other words, even if this does not work, and we go through the process, the prevailing party in those recommendations can take those recommendations, and the uh, court would hear those. Um, so, so what we're asking for tonight is the authority for the city administrator to actually set up a dispute review board, a resolution board, um, and to negotiate agreements with service providers, that would be our city appointee, and enter an agreement and compensate for the city's portion of the third party member, the one that's mutually selected by both parties. Okay? 
and then also to authorize expenses associated with meeting a facility cost. So what we're asking for is basically an umbrella authority to be able to um, compensate our appointee, compensate half the shared appointee, and then also cover our meeting costs. Okay. Um, and then also there may be miscellaneous costs associated with the DRB board operation. Uh, there may be, I don't know, it, it's the meeting cost parts of it. I, this is not something I go through every day. It's not something that most cities go through every day. So it's, just, it's kind of like new territory for us. Okay, so what we're asking for is a not to exceed authority of about $35,000. That will cover about two weeks um, of effort by the board. That's eight hour days, five eight hour days, two weeks of that. Um, I don't think it will take that long. It shouldn't take that long, um, but this is our best guess of what it might take at the, at the high end. So what we're asking for is the, the authority for the administrator to go ahead and form this board to expend those funds, um, and in this case, uh, to reach an agreement with Mr. John Hunt. Now that agreement, and that should be, hopefully, is in your packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it in there? It is. Okay. Yeah. He is he is our appointee, and you'll notice he has he has great qualifications for this position, um, and we would really like to see him on the board. However, Scott Lee can say no, we don't want him, and then we've got to go back to the drawing board. Watchdot maintains two lists of DRB candidates. One is for the agency, and one is called third party. Um, what we're suggesting that uh, he, Mr. Hunt is on both. In other words, he worked for uh, both the. He's been appointed by agencies. He's also been appointed as a third party um, appointee as well. Uh, but he must be accepted for seating by the contractor. And if not, then what the administrator would do is he would go to those lists of approved, vetted appointees that Washdot's already gone through and said these people fit, and he would find somebody else. Okay? That's what we're asking. Mr. Peterson. We have the ability also to object to uh, Salt Lake's um, designee. Yes, absolutely. We, and in fact, that's an issue that we're, we're grappling with right now. Um, I, this is a new process for them. It's a new process for us. So let's uh, be sure you bring that to the context. The current appointee that they've suggested looks more like a representative, okay, as opposed, as opposed to somebody who's not dispassionate about the process or impartial. Um, and so we have some concerns there. And his experience isn't really in this venue either. So we have some concerns there. So we're going to go back and we're going to address that with them as well. And we've been advised that it's important at this stage in the process to address that. So we're, we're planning to do that. John, what are your thoughts on this? The process, I think, is a good idea. Um, we're light on details as to what the, the, the meat of Scout Lake's claims are. Uh, so we get a we get two things we get information and then we get what I would consider if you, you're in front of a judge you, you may get a judge who's never seen this issue before if you're in front of the board and you have the right people on the board you get experts in the field who I think have a lot of credibility to provide a decision that should be should be respected for sure so I, I think it's a good process I think we sh I think we should go forward with it. Yes, um, is Scout Lake's proposed representative on the list that the DOT that Washington maintains? No. I would um, strongly recommend that you object to any representative from Scout Lake that isn't on the Washington's list. Okay. Further questions or comments? I support your comment. On the other hand, if they have somebody that's on there that's not experienced um, and handles it poorly, um, is that in our advantage? But we don't, we don't know the outcome, obviously. My experience has been that when people don't know what they're doing, it's... Um, adds an unexpected element of chaos 
that is not helpful to either party. No. Okay. <laughs> is there a motion? If, Mayor Crowder, if I could add, I, I, I think what we would, we would like to um, obtain from the council is if at a staff level we're not comfortable with Scott Lake's represent, representative, and I think we've heard you loud and clearly. I, we're vetting that issue right now, um, and we'll make a determination. And if you want us to check with you, we'll be glad to do that first. But I, I, I think we're pretty good with your direction. and we, We've had our own internal discussion. Okay. We'll, we'll proceed based yeah, on your input. Yes, I am. Great. Need a motion for Ms. Sylvie? Um, I specifically do not want to include that in the motion, so that's why I just said it as a recommendation. Um, but I would move that we authorize the city administrator to execute agreements associated with the formation and operation of the CARS Project Dispute Review Board to include agreements for services for the city and third party board members, as well as costs for meeting and facility costs for a not to exceed amount of $35,000. Second. Been seconded by Ms. Nyhagen. Any further discussion? Well, and to clarify my comment, um, I wanted to make the bit about objecting to them, their representative, as a recommendation, but I don't want to um, tie your hands um, based on what you find out as you get those. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. <clears throat> Mr. Rizzatello, expansion of information technology services. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this agenda bill that comes before you is uh, basically the addition of four hours a week to our contract with Intermountain Education Service District for uh, information technology services. Uh, coming on board here and just seeing how the organization uh, runs, uh, Larry's position is bogged down with several disparate duties of building official, facilities manager, IT manager, and uh, this is getting some additional relief to uh, execute projects in the city since we are a complex organization. We've all, already contracted with them uh, for basically the eight hours a week. This is adding uh, four more. Uh, for this year, that would come out of the uh, Technology Service Reserve Fund. Uh, in future years, this would just be part of the out of the Information Technology Fund, and uh, that would be backfilled, hopefully, our occurring expense with the Transportation Benefit District, because that's why uh, we were holding off including this in the budget a couple months ago, uh, just because of how slim current expenses, uh, but really seeing all the projects going on around here, uh, this really would behoove us to uh, add some additional hours here. Questions for Mr. Rizzatello? <clears throat> Is there a motion? I would move that the City Council authorize the change in contract with the Intermountain Education Service District and ESD for 12 hours a week to begin April 1st, 2017. It's been moved by Ms. Nyhagen. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Mr. Peterson. Any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Mr. Ricard, Historic Preservation. Okay, so back in uh, January, this was a workshop discussion, and um, so I had a draft ordinance in there, and it was pretty much stayed the same. So we just wanted to kind of focus a little bit more on the content of the ordinance, um, and then bring this back to you at the last meeting in March, I think on the 28th, um, for adoption. And what that'll do is allow us to become a certified local government and then apply for some grants with, through DAP um, for what uh, 
doing historic uh, inventory so we can figure out what type of you know what structures we have that we might want to approach property owners on uh, for including in, a, in the registry. So, purpose of the ordinance is to um, safeguard the uh, heritage of College Place and, and include buildings of historical significance. Um, uh, foster civic and neighborhood pride, stabilize uh, or improve aesthetics um, and the economy, economic, economic vitality, um, encourage and provide incentives for private owners for preservation and restoration, so creating a financial incentive uh, for, for people to protect their historic properties and improve them. Um, and then promote and facilitate the early identification and resolution of conflicts between preservation of historic resources and alternative land uses. And so what that means is we don't know what we have out there. Um, and a good example of that is the barn down in Country Estates. I mean, yeah, I knew it was there, and, you know, probably everybody knew it was there, but until somebody starts to, you know, apply for permits to take or dismantle something, then we, you know, we start to panic. So let's identify what's out there, get them on some lists, and, and then get active in trying to get those property owners to, um, to preserve them or find alternative uses um, rather than remove them from our communities. So it's a, there's a creation of a commission, and it's five, it can be from five to seven members. Um, uh, that is recommending that we do a five member commission because we're a smaller community. It's sometimes harder to get and maintain an active seven member uh, uh, commission, particularly because two of, the, two of those positions have to be professionals, like an architect or an engineer or a planner. Um, so, um, and they also have to be a resident. There's some exemptions for the residents. For, uh, for instance, if we're having a really hard time filling the professional positions, we can go outside of our community. I mean, we would stay within the county, um, but that's an option. Um, the powers and duties, um, they're primarily a recommending body, but um, they, they do, they maintain the, the College Place Historic Inventory, uh, and they maintain the College Place Register of Historic Places, and then they review nominations to those, um, those inventory lists. Um, and then they also, if, if you have a property on the inventory list and you want to make changes to it other than maintenance sort of things, then they review those um, those applications. Um, of course, everything's uh, conducted in public meeting, those reviews. Um, and then they also act as the local review board and work with the assessor's office on the special valuations. And so what that is is you have to spend, there's, there's RCWs that regulate it, but you have to spend, the project has to be at least 25% of the assessed valuation. And um, so say you're, you're going to repair rotting siding or something and it's, you know, huge and it's all historically has to be put back and it costs you, you know, $80,000. Well, you can take that actual cost and subtract it from your assessed valuation. Um, so therefore, reducing your, your overall tax tax rate, property tax rate. Um, <clears throat> the Register of Historic Places, so um, in order to get a property on, on that list, it has to um, have some, you know, associated history with the, with the community. Um, it has, it, it has to have integrity. Uh, it has to be at least 50 years old. Um, and they have, there's 10 things in there and I only listed five of them, but basically um, they have to fit into these 10 categories. And so national, or it has to have national, state, or his, local history, distinctive architectural type uh, for a period or style. Um, it could have an outstanding uh, designer. So, if, you know, a famous architect maybe built it, um, you know, for a place like uh, we had in Walla Walla had some of their parks designed by the Olmsted brothers and so 
and they they were famous. They traveled across, so you could you could have a particular piece of property or place that, that fell into that category. Um, so, uh, or you know, somebody of historical significance to the the community or the state or the region. So, um, process for designating properties. Um, anybody can can nominate a building, but you have to have consent of the property owner. So, um, and that's the caveat in it. You know, there there are fewer communities that um, allow anybody to nominate without um, property owner consent, but um, I, we don't recommend it. I mean, I, this really needs to be driven by the property owner because if, if you get a property that's listed on there, um, without the consent of the property owner, they're just ne they're they're going to be resentful, or have they could have the potential to be resentful, and then just neglect the property, and you could lose it by just you know it, allowing it to you know they're not updating their wiring code and the place burns down, or they don't repair the roof and it just collapses in another 20 years or something. So. Um, that's basically it. Um, just reading through. Mm, it's kind of the, the gist of it. Um, adoption. Uh, so, like I said earlier, you know, once we get the ordinance adopted, um, it allows us to then become apply to become a CLG, um, and then we can uh, apply for grants to do an inventory. Um, there's some other options out there too, granting you know, opportunities. So, any com uh, questions or comments? Ms. Selby. Um, on the valuation adjustment, can that carry forward to future property owners? Like if you fix it up and sell it? I believe so, um, and, and it's good for 10 years. Yep. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very confident. I live next door to that barn and I'm really sick about it. I'm thinking about, um, and it's just, it's history because I checked, I used to be the manager, one of the managers there, and it's one of the fifth oldest barns in Washington State. And I'm thinking now about that, Jerry, about the, the old house that sits there in the middle. The that would farm. Yeah. the poor yeah. farmhouse. Yes, mm -hmm. I would think that would be definitely something that would need to be worked on. Um, uh, uh, I, it's uh, I would just like to add about the poor farmhouse. There is an organization who's interested in acquiring it, but the property tax valuation that is allowed with this. Uh, that's pretty much the breaking point for them where they need the valuation, so. Oh, okay, thank you. It's very historic, very historic as uh, Jerry's wife grew up there, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and the barn just is, is really a sad situation. In that. But if we have to have, and I understand why, we have to have the, uh, the signature of the owners then in some places we're going to be in trouble. It, we would have been in trouble with the barn because I don't think they would have given it, but it's a sad thing to see it go. I'd like to be, I on, that I'd like to be on that committee. <laughs> Any further questions, discussion? Actually, I have one other question. It, you said that it um, applies to outbuildings on the site. Um, what about outbuildings that were like added later? So like, you have a site that has, this is a really historic thing with, you know, a 20 year old garage yeah. behind it. No, it, this, this, the outbuildings have to, have to, generally they have to be of the same, they would need to be of the same architectural style and built in the same, you know, time frame. Um, they're, if, if you don't have that in there, um, it can cause problems. You, you, you don't. There are communities that don't recognize outbuildings, but um, you really should. But you don't have. So somebody that got it on historic preservation wouldn't necessarily have to keep the old shed that somebody threw up in some of them. Right. Fair enough. Chicken coop. 
<laughs> Further questions? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion from the City Council? Is there a motion to adjourn? Someone. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you very much. Okay.